like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Well, good morning, and welcome to the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, and where we join together that the very Spirit of God might become part of our being, that this process of merging with the Father, merging with the Son. We join together for this purpose, and I thank you for being here for this. Let's go to our, in our bulletins, we have our invocation, and let's say our invocation three times softer and softer. Then we'll drift into the silence. We take our words to Yahweh, as the prophet Hosea said, together. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence, one power, God the good, omnipotence. We take this moment of silence to realize that at the core of our being, we are made in the image and the likeness of God. At the very depth of who we are, at the level of our souls, we are one with God, made in God's image. We give thanks for this oneness and we ask for congruence that our surface mind, our surface emotions might truly reflect this knowledge at the depth of our soul, that we are one with God, that there may be no doubt, no question as to who we are, what our status is as sons and daughters of God. We ask this in Jesus' name, that this revelation might be made clear without the faintest doubt. And we ask for this, knowing that Jesus is that open door. And we grab his hand and walk together one with the Christ. And to help in this process, let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle James wrote, you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, when we hear something like that, and we know at a certain level of life, it's absolutely true. We're here, we're gone, we vanish. It gives us a reason to be grateful for the life we have right now when we have it. What I'd like to do this morning is to continue our talk a bit from last week about gratitude and miracles. 
And what I'd like to do is go to the book of, uh, of John and talk about where Jesus is accused of being demon-possessed because he has committed these miracles. He's, he's done these miracles. And uh, you know, they, they more or less accuse him of being you know, from the devil rather than from God. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I don't nev- I've never figured out why they called him a Samaritan there, because he's clearly from Galilee, not from Samaria. But uh, Jesus says, I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking, to gl- seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the, G- the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because there was a belief in those days that if someone was born blind, it was because of a sin of either the parents or the, the child. And, and this isn't so well known, but the Pharisees believed in reincarnation. There's very many, you know, there's many, many schools of thought in, in early Judaism, and one, you know, several of them believed in reincarnation. So that was the, the root of that question. But Jesus ducks it; he doesn't really want to get into it. He says, "Neither this man nor his parents sinned," said Jesus. But this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it's day, we must do the, the work of Him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world. I am the light of the world. One of the seven great I am statements of Jesus. I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, I won't read the rest of this story, but it's, it's a long story about how no one quite believes that this blind man from birth can now see. And they say, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? <laughs> and they say, how could it be? You know, and he'd say, yes, that was me. And they take him to the synagogue, and the Pharisees don't believe it either. So they pull in the parents, they drag, drag the parents in there. And, uh, and they say, you know, who did this? He says, I don't know who did this. Because <laughs> he, you know, he couldn't see until he washed his eyes okay, at, at the pool. And... Uh, you know, and they say, they accuse him, uh, this man of, you know, whoever he was of being a demon. They know it's Jesus. Okay, but they accuse him of, of being a Jesus, or a demon that, that healed him. And the man said, well, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I don't see that. <laughs> I, you know, I can see now, and I couldn't see before, and what demon would do this for me? But it's, it's I mean, there's a whole lot in this passage. There's, there's a whole lot. And, and really, we could go for hours on, on who Jesus is and and what he's doing, I'm going to keep it a little bit more focused on the miracle side of it. And then sort of to continue from uh, you know, last week's passage. You know, remember last week where we were reading when Jesus had fed the 5,000, and then he you know, goes across the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and they, the crowds follow him, and he comes, they come to him the next day, and he says, you're only here because I fed you, and you want me to feed you again. And he, he might have just as well said in, in today's language, he might have just as well said, you're here because you want to get rich quick. Okay? Or you're here because you want to be healed. Or you're here because you want me to wave my magic wand and your spouses will love you and your children are going to obey you. Okay? It's just basically you're here because you're looking for miracles rather than 
You're here because you want to connect with the divine. So Jesus says there, I tell you the truth, you were looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. The truth is that miracles never satisfy the soul. The soul, at the level of the soul, recognizes that the divine has complete mastery over the material world. Miracles satisfy the human within us. We think, without our doing the work, our lives can be transformed. And there's nothing wrong with this per se, but the deeper message of Jesus is, find that which is going to satisfy your soul. And that's always love. Finding the way to love. It's because our very nature is love. God is love, it tells us in the book of John. So only love will nourish us completely. Miracles will never do this. They do excite us. And there are those among us who will say, if only I could see a sign or a miracle, then I could believe. Now I'll tell you a really funny story. Because I went to India in 1986 with a couple of friends. And one of my friends, a very good friend, Edward Edward was his name, was convinced that if he could see someone levitate, that he could levitate himself. Okay, it was like this burning desire. So we're in New Delhi, and he has no idea where to go or who to ask. So who does he ask? The cab driver. (laughs) You know, you know, (laughs) a guaranteed source of spiritual wisdom. Now, I'm not with him when he's asking the cab driver, but you know, he's just been talking about it for days, you know, going, going over there, and he wants to see someone actually levitate. So he's ripe for being defrauded, in all truth, okay? because he's, he's ready to believe anything. So the cab driver says, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> just no problem, no problem. <laughs> and he, he drives him to a park, and, uh, and there's a group of men there, and lo and behold, one of them levitates. Now, it's not quite what you think, But he comes back to the hotel so excited. He says, I saw someone levitate. I saw it. You guys got to come see it. And and of course, we're not dumb. (laughs) We don't believe him. (laughs) And when we we throw it all over, what is it? What is it? Did you you really see? He says, well, really, he said, they they wouldn't show it to me fully. But they they put a sheet over this one fellow who says, it's not really right to show the world yet this fully. So, So he says, but I saw this man's body float up parallel. His feet were down there and his head was here, you know, while the sheet was over him. It was really amazing. It was a miracle. And we go, I don't know. But fortunately, and this, this fellow was very enthusiastic. Come on, we go see. Okay, you know, what are you going to say? You've you got to go see. It's going to be a good show no matter what. And fortunately, the, one of the other friends with us is a very good amateur magi- magician. Okay, it's just, just pure gift of God that he's with us. But so he wants to see the trick. He knows it's a trick. But uh, anyway, we drive up. You know, we get that same cab driver, you know, who's, who Edward is giving him tip after tip. You know, of, just because he's <laughs> so happy with all this. And we drive up, and my friend, the musician, says, "Oh, that's the fellow right there in the uh, in the red dhoti that's going to be doing it." And Ed says, "No, it's the guy in the green dhoti that can do it." I'm I'm making up these colors. And Chris says, "No, no, I saw him." And put the prop in there. And Ed, Edward looks at him and says, what is that? <laughs> doesn't quite grasp it. So what the trick is, I'll tell you all the trick. I'll sort of, sort of uh, spare you all the, uh, the, the drama of it. And I'll, I'll be very awkward and ungainly here. But they, they, the reason this, the magician could see it is this fellow put the stick down his pants. Okay? And, and he said, I saw the prop being stuck down this guy's... And, and of course, that should have been a telltale to Ed... Edward, that, uh, you know, not, two people aren't going to be levitating, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, so they, what the trick was is uh, they throw this sheet over this fellow. I don't know if this is going to show on the, on the camera or not. <laughs> but they throw the sheet over this fellow. He's a very, they're very acrobatic. He pulls the stick out and puts um, one, takes one shoe off, puts it on the stick, and leans back with one leg up like this, 
the other leg holding the shoe up like this, and his head's back like this, but the sheet is covering everything. So it looks just like there's two shoes on one end of the sh underneath the sheet, and his head on the other end, and it looks like he's levitating. But <laughs> the, the, there's some things about this. Is it, you know, because we say, if I see a miracle, then I can really believe. Okay? Now, Edward could not, in that gap between we had, you know, when we had debunked his, uh, his miracle of levitation and the actual, you know, the, the time when he first believed it, okay, he was not floating around the room. Okay? And Jesus, you know, talked about this, you know, when he was very, in the very early days of his ministry, he's out healing in Galilee and there's so little faith he couldn't do any miracles there. He says, I can't believe how little faith they have. Now, next, next week we're going to talk about the, the Hebrew word for faith. And, and the translation of it in, in the various places it shows up, because it's very interesting. It doesn't quite mean what we think it means. But the, uh, the, the problem with miracles are we think they will solve our life, our life problems. We think they will change our mind. And in reality, we'll see a miracle and, you know, it, it'll shift us a little and then just can't, we don't know what to do. So like, we see it and we put it on the bookshelf because we can't quite know how to integrate it. There's a, a really funny story that Irma Bombeck tells. And I think Irma is Jewish because she's making this a story about a Jewish grandmother. She says, yeah, there's this Jewish grandmother with her grandson at the beach, a little, little you know, toddler, two years old, something like this. And she puts a big hat on him to keep him protected from the sun. And she sort of dozes off. And then a huge wave comes in, grabs the sun and takes him out to the ocean. And of course, the grandmother wakes up with this and is completely distraught. And she says, God, if you'll save my grandson, I promise I'll make it up to you. I'll join whatever club you want me to join. I'll volunteer at the hospital. I'll give to the poor. Anything that makes you happy. Suddenly, another huge wave comes in and whoosh, the sun has returned. I mean, it's a miracle. <laughs> but what does she say? She says, he had a hat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is <laughs> what connects us to God is love and where we are right now you know this week of Thanksgiving week you know the, the easiest way to access this love is through gratitude absolute gratitude and so I you know I'm I, I just I so much want to go back to this, this sense of asking ourselves, what is it that we have to be grateful for? I'll tell you another, from another writer, a fellow's name is Michael Masterson, and he has a, uh, probably one of the, the biggest um, email newsletters on health and happiness and wealth on the Internet that I'm aware of. Okay, and you know, he, he writes all these really nice, interesting articles. He's really a businessman. You know, so there's a lot of how to, make, how to succeed in business, how to write good copy, how to, you know, really big on customer service. And also, so he brings in people who write about health and all this. It's really interesting. Of course, they're selling you things the whole time, but that's all right. They, they, do, they do a really good job. And right now, he's, for, you know, just by coincidence, like we're talking about India, he's over in India. And he's writing all these articles back about, like, customer service in India, how profoundly different it is there, you know, he says, you go to a hotel, and every time you pass a maid cleaning in the room, she stops whatever she's doing, and, she's, and she you know, says, namaste. You know, it's just like, it says, it's just a whole different cultural experience. He says, it's, it's incredible customer service. But he's, he's talking about one day on this trip, while well, he's out, you know, he stops to go look at something, and of course, all the beggars come up to him. And he says, everywhere you go, there's beggars. And the tour guide keeps saying, do not give them anything. There is no starvation in India. And it's, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there would have been. You know, India has really changed o over the decades. But, um, you know, and certainly, you know, like in the, in the uh, you know, Bangladesh had it in the 70s, you know, just different, different places. And he's talking about, he's really got a spiritual bend on life because he's talking about what we have to be grateful for. And he says, you look at our, our country, and the lives we have 
and all the things there are to be grateful for. He says, these beggars are begging not because they don't want to work. They're begging because they have no jobs. They would work in a heartbeat if they could get a job. In the United States, if you want to work, I mean, it may not be the best paying job, but if you want to work, you can get a job, by and large, you know, unless you're mentally handicapped or something physically handicapped. But he says, look at what's happening in this world right now. You know, we have famine in Niger and Chad and Ethiopia, South Sudan, Somalia, Zimbabwe. We have severe drought and military conflicts that are starving millions in Kenya, Somalia, the, the Djibouti, sorry, I don't even know where that one is, in Ethiopia. The Darfur conflict has left an estimated 450,000 people dead. And we still have violence. Israel, Pakistan, Chechnya, Iraq, Kashmir, Peru, Algeria, Libya, and Afghanistan. And when we think about these terrible things, I mean, our only comfort, really, is to go to gratitude. That, you know, you know, not to say we don't work or try and help or this sort of thing, but what brings us closer to God is this feeling of gratitude, big or small, the things in our lives, the country we live in, the opportunities we have here. But what's so interesting, he says about these Indians, is how happy they are, universally happy. Just, he says, and and he, he, he puts it to you know, having a very well-defined social, social structure. You know, everyone sort of knows their place and they're just you know, happy enough with it and they've got their family. They've got, they all live with their extended families. I don't know if I have time to read this. But I brought the uh, first presidential proclamation by George Washington for Thanksgiving Day. I think I'm going to read it no matter what. It is, it is such a great thing. So this is in 1789. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have by the Joint Committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer, to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then unite them all in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation, for the signal and manifold mercies and favorable interpositions of his providence in the course and the conclusion of the late war, for the great degree of tranquility, union, and plenty which we have since enjoyed, for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have been enabled to establish constitutions of government for our safety and happiness, and particularly the national one now lately instituted for the civil and religious liberty with which we are all blessed. That was the uh, Bill of Rights. And the means we have of acquiring and diffusing useful knowledge and in general for all the great and various favors which he has been pleased to confer upon us. And also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions, to enable us all, whether in public or private stations, to perform our several and relative duties properly and punctually, to render our national government a blessing to all the people, by constantly being a government of wise, just, and constitutional laws, discreetly and faithfully executed and obeyed, to protect and guide all sovereigns and nations, especially such as have shown kindness to us, and to bless them with good governments, peace, and concord, to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue, 
and the increase of such increase of science among them and us, and generally, to grant unto mankind such a degree of temporal prosperity as he alone knows to be best. Given under my hand, to the city of New York, this third date of October, in the year of our Lord, 1789, George Washington. It gives you a flavor of how our country was founded and the very you know, foundations of gratitude to God that this country started under. Now, I'd like to shift this slightly into a talk or a uh, discussion on connecting with God and this process. It really does start with gratitude, but usually there is a very deep experience. It's as though God first gives us love, an experience of love, and then we love him back. Now, start by talking about Mother Teresa. Now, we're all familiar with Mother Teresa. In 1979, you know, Mother Teresa, this Roman Catholic nun, was given the Nobel Peace Prize. Most of her adult life was spent ministering to the poor and the diseased in Calcutta. She accepted this prize with the comment, I am unworthy. And everyone just thought, oh, what wonderful humility. But what's come out lately is this sort of a memoir. It's called uh, Come Be My Light, published by Doubleday. It's a collection of private letters to her spiritual advisors. And then there, what you find is that Mother Teresa had these extraordinary experiences with God in the beginning of her life, the beginning of her career. They just so grabbed her and so... You know, she felt so much this love of Christ and wanted to serve Christ through serving all these humble and poor and diseased people. And then she hit a long, dry spell of feeling no connection to God. And so when she's saying, I'm unworthy, what she's really saying is, I don't have this connection to God anymore. But the fact is, she continued on anyway. She continued on anyway. Now, I would be willing to say, by virtue of the fact that we're all adults here, and we're still here, looking, seeking, that all of us have had moments of absolute clarity, of connection, a miracle of the divine, so to speak. And we want that to become a full-time reality. And the, the Talmud has a, a discussion on this. And I, I, I quote Jewish literature because Jesus was Jewish. And, you know, I, I would just rather not disconnect entirely from that, that tradition that he comes from. The rabbi said, this is from the Talmud, some people acquire their share in the world to come in one moment whereas others acquire their share in the world to come in a few moments. Now, when they say the share of the world to come, it's a glimpse of the divine. And they're saying some people have it just once, some people sort of have it you know, here, 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 and here. But it, you know, in the Jewish tradition, you know, the, the commentary on this statement is it says, you know, we study and do good works on and on and on and on, just like Mother Teresa did. And why would it not be said that we acquire our share in the world to come over the course of years. And it's because there are these miraculous moments. If anyone's ever done like a Catholic novena, where you know, the, in the Catholic tradition, the mystics, the, the monks will repeat prayers over and over and over and over again. You know, there are Father or Hail Mary or, you know, there's one of the Venus, Dark Angel, Michael. There's, there's, a, there's a whole slew of long, repetitive prayers. I can tell in my experience doing these, because I've done them, is that most of the time, they're boring as all get out. <laughs> and occasionally, there's like this huge aha moment. It's like, oh, that's what I'm saying here. That's what this means here. 
You know, this, and, and that makes it all those boring hours well worthwhile. I mean, you get a certain energy just from you know, chanting and praying. You do, but, but sometimes you, you know, the, your mind, after a while, you memorize the thing, your, your mouth is going along, your lips are moving, and you're thinking about something else, and you're thinking, why am I doing this? Okay? But it's because there are moments of absolute clarity and absolute connection. And those are the moments that draw us in and keep us connected to God. You know, Jesus tells us how to find more love, how to connect to God. He tells us this, you know, right on in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the children of God. You know, just, and it's, it's, and then he goes, you know, right after that into, you know, the, the shift from the Mosaic Law into what I'll call the, the Law of Jesus, so to speak. You know, the, the Christian code, which, which becomes, it's not just enough for you to um, not murder a man. You can't be angry with him. It's not enough for you to uh, just be um, non-adulterous. You can't have lustful thoughts. Okay? Jesus is taking the code of behavior given by Moses to a deeper level, really saying, well, we have to have mastery of our feelings and our thoughts. And in that, we become these blessed peacemakers. These practices, once we start gaining this, set the stage for our connecting to the divine. And, and the easiest of them is to go to gratitude. You know, it's sometimes very hard to forgive people. But thoughts come up that pull off us off the center of being one with God. We can go back to gratitude. So, you know, next week, Sunday, next Sunday is the start of Advent. So, my request, my homework, so to speak, for you and for me this week is to do a mental fast in preparation for Advent. Advent is this time of preparation for the birth of Christ. And for us to claim this connection, this rebirth within us, we want to prepare ourselves. So my request is, if we find ourselves grumbling this week, complaining about anything, okay, that don't fight it, just replace it with something that you're grateful for. If you find yourself angry with someone, don't fight it. Just replace it with something that you're grateful for. And then I want to hear next week how it goes. <laughs> I'm going to be here. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh. Oh, okay. John, are you going to give the sermon next week? Sure. All right. <laughs> I forgot all. I forgot all about that. Okay, all right. Let's. Uh, we have to get going here. Let's pray here for a moment. All right. Let's close our eyes. Just take a breath in. Breathe in the very breath of God. And just feel any tension within your body. Just let the attention go there very briefly. And love it. And let it go. Be grateful for your body. And just take a moment to be grateful for our minds. Our minds serve us wonderfully. And let the attention move into the heart. And let's be grateful for the love within our being. And it is here 
that we want to create a throne for Almighty God. And if it's easy, mentally imagine in your heart a beautiful celestial throne room, luminous. The throne is elevated. It is self-luminous. Light is pouring forth from the very throne. So bright we can hardly look at it. But as our eyes become more attuned to this luminous light of God, we notice it sitting on this throne as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we say, Welcome, Lord. Come into my heart. My heart is open to you. Come. Come. And let us just for a moment be thankful. Whether we realize Christ is there in our heart or not, He is there. And our job is to welcome Him, to thank Him for the grace that He bestows upon us in our very life. The very air we breathe, the beating of our hearts. Is this not grace? Is this not the love of the divine? And allow this love in our hearts, this very presence, to expand, to fill everyone, to fill this entire room. Because He is here, in this very place within our hearts. He is here, where two or more of us are gathered together in His name. And now let this love expand out. Imagine it encircling this globe that we might see all upon this globe those that we call friends, those that we call enemies, those that we call nothing, that our love might encompass them, that we might recognize within them the very presence of God that is within us. And now let us return to our own hearts this energy, this presence, and seal it with the love of God. Then let our energy move down through our body, through our torso, through our legs, through our calves, down to the very soles of our feet, that we might be grounded on this earth, having put on, so to speak, the very light of God, the very light of the Christ, who has said, I am the light of this world. Having put this light on, that we might now be grounded and walk firmly on this earth in service to the Christ. In your holy name, amen.